Now, Lord, I pray that you'll help us as we study today, guide our thoughts, inspire our words, let anointing be to one and all. We ask it in the name above every name, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Well, I want to talk about prayer and its role in a mighty move of God. I want to uh, uh, start in the book of Acts, and I want to read an extended part here. Uh, let's start with verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to read uh, uh, several verses down here. Um, verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Those were the words of Jesus. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Now, he's getting into um, the selection of a 12th apostle to take up the ministry of Judas. They voted, and Matthias was the one who was appointed to be the 12th of the, of the apostles. And there were other good men, uh, great candidates, but the one that they... Uh, arrived at was Matthias. Now this was all done in a prayerful attitude and setting. Verse 1 of chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And that's where we're going to stop. Lord, bless the reading of your word. Amen. Last week, we talked about every significant um, great awakening, move of God is grounded, has always been grounded in prayer. And it hasn't changed. It started that way right here in the book of Acts. Jesus ascended they I imagine they stood there with their mouths wide open 
as they watched Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, be lifted up into the air, and <laughs> didn't know what to think about all this. And two angels came to him and said, why are you standing here gazing up into the sky? This same Jesus is going to return in like manner. Now, I want you to know that is an exceeding great and precious promise. We are looking for the return of Jesus, just like he left, so he's coming back. And I say, even so, come Lord Jesus. That is our hope. It's a wonderful hope. It's a hope like nobody else has. From this, they had been in Jesus' presence. They go to the upper room. We assume, we think, we figure it's the same room where Jesus celebrated the Passover with his apostles prior to his passion. But we know that it was an upper room. That's an upstairs room. And it had enough room for about 120 people at least. We believe that upwards as many as 500 people saw him ascend. But only 120 ended up in the prayer room. Now figure out that math and you'll figure out why it works that way in our churches as well. Lots of people never make an appearance in the prayer room. And what they're doing is just absolutely giving away the greatest blessings that God wants to give to them. They're saying, no thanks, had enough, don't need that too. That's too bad, that's a shame. That's a big lesson that uh, maybe should come on another day. But the faithful ones who were living on the promise that he's coming back, went to a prayer room, and there they stayed and prayed. It was about 10 days, 120 people. And among that number were, except for Judas, all the original uh, apostles, uh, a lot of the other people who wor worked closely with the ministry, including Matthias, who was brought into the level of apostle. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her other children. Now, there are some people who would teach you that, that Mary uh, never had any other children other than Jesus. The Bible refutes that, uh, and we just read it. Mary um, did not, she, she gave, as a virgin, she gave birth to Jesus. She had been overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. This was the Son of God. But she was married uh, to Joseph. And they had children like my wife and I have had our children. If you have, have kids, don't, don't take much to figure out how this happens. <laughs> it just is natural. It's the way things uh, are supposed to be. And Mary married to uh, a good man, a carpenter, uh, an understanding and a godly man uh, raised a family with Jesus as the oldest child but not the only child now um, they stayed together Jesus ascended after roughly 40 days after his resurrection and the day of Pentecost was 50 days after uh, after the resurrection. The day of Pentecost was fully come. Jesus arose on a Sunday morning and Pentecost Sunday was in fact a Sunday, seven weeks later. And so we're talking about a roughly a, a, a nine or a 10 day prayer meeting. Now I think if we had a nine or a 10 day prayer meeting where people were excited about uh, just watching Jesus ascend into the clouds, we might have a powerful prayer meeting. <laughs> we have 
a, a, a wonderful time, spiritual time, calling out to the Lord and communing with the Lord. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, all 50 days were accomplished from uh, the uh, Feast of First Fruits. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven. It was like a rushing, mighty wind. Now, I've never been in a house hit by a tornado. I've heard eyewitness accounts that say it sounded like a freight train coming through. I have been in a house where there's been a lot of wind, powerful wind, and it got loud and it got scary. They were in this prayer meeting and they prayed the glory down. A sound from heaven, like a rushing mighty wind. It didn't say a wind blew through, it said there was a sound. And um, the words that, that, we, that we read was that, it, it, that sound filled all the house where they were sitting. It was a mighty roar. And then something happened that is not an always thing. Uh, the, the sound of a rushing mighty wind is not an always thing. And the cloven tongues, the divided tongues, like fire sitting up on each of them, that is not an always thing. We don't see that repeated in the annals of, uh, of Scripture, certainly not in the book of Acts. But then something that is repeated in the book of Acts. It said, and they, um, they were all, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When you see the Holy Ghost fall in the book of Acts, that is the birth of the church age, of the church age that we live in today, when the Holy Ghost indwells, when it comes with power and might, people speak in tongues. Now, some of you don't have necessarily a history of being around uh, what is clinically called glossolalia. I'll call it speaking in tongues. It's in the scriptures. <laughs> if in the scriptures, you can't deny it. Uh, you may resist it, but you can't deny it. There it is. Uh, and I don't resist it. I've experienced it. And it's, uh, it's an amazing thing uh, of how your spirit can be so overwhelmed. Baptism, one of the uh, one of the translations for the word that is, that is baptism is to be overwhelmed. You're baptized in the Holy Ghost. You are overwhelmed by the Spirit of God as He comes in to stay, to dwell. Oh my, my time is getting away from me. What happens uh it doesn't always happen immediately, but when it does happen, that you are filled with the Holy Ghost, maybe you need to tarry a little while. I did. But one time you're going to feel an unction to speak in tongues and just let it go. Don't let anybody teach you a, a prayer language for crying out loud. Let the Holy Ghost teach you your prayer language. Uh, you don't need somebody else saying, uh, 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 for whatever reason, you mouth kind of gets sideways and that's it, that's it, that's it. No, 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 no. When you get the Holy Ghost, if you get the genuine article, you'll know you got the Holy Ghost. You're not going to need anybody to affirm to you that you received the Holy Ghost. It is a very real experience. And the speaking in tongues just kind of goes right along with it. And just relax, enjoy it, let it happen. Uh, it's, biblically speaking, it is perfectly normal. Now, 
what happened from here is this prayer meeting and the 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 Holy Ghost outpouring was uh, it 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 was so outstanding that it got people's attention and they looked at these folks who were uh, carried away in prayer saying they're a bunch of drunkards. Peter stood up and said, "These these men, these people are not drunk like you suppose they are." But this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. Then the last day said, God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he ushered in this time that we live in, right then, called the latter days. We are in the latter days officially because God is pouring out his spirit upon people, not just in America, all over the world. As a matter of fact, the Pentecostal movement which is um, um, identified with the, um, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and speaking out of the tongues. It's strong all over the world. Uh, South America, Africa. Um, we'd like for it to be stronger in Europe, but there are parts of Asia. Um, there are all over the world, people are coming into this experience, it is estimated there are uh, somewhere close to 400,000, uh, actually I think that's more like 400 million people um, that are Pentecostal Christians around the world. I need to get my numbers right, don't I? Uh, but I believe it's 400 million people. Uh, we're talking about Charismatics, Assembly of God, United Pentecostal, Independent, uh, and a lot of other organizations. Folks, you're not saved by an organization. You're saved by the Word of God and the Spirit of God and taking covenant relationship in your life in the name of Jesus. You are saved by the grace of God, not by the card you carry in your pocket. That being said, I'm United Pentecostal. I like being United Pentecostal. Um, uh, I pay my dues, I fellowship with the brethren and sisters, uh, but they don't save me. Jesus saves me. This, this latter day experience was ushered in by intense, prevailing prayer. That's the point I'm trying to make today. If our churches are going to grow, it's going to be because we pray. If we win a soul, it's going to be because we pray. If we grow close to God, it's going to be because we pray. Folks, we've got to talk to God. This is a resource readily available to all Christians and unfortunately not used by very many. It's too bad. Prayer is a call upon all of our lives, not just some. Some prevail in prayer more than others. That's just a fact. I believe it grieves the heart of God. He wants us all to be praying people. That's why in, in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, when he's laying out the, uh, the full armor of God, he sums it all up by adding prayer. Prayer. It's so very important and so very beneficial. Now, let me go on. There was a great, for the great awakening that was taking place in Wales that was ushered in by people giving themselves to prayer. Not 30 seconds at a time. I mean, they were committed to spending time with God. It might, let me tell you what. God it does not he he doesn't keep a timer. But being the human people that we are, what you devote your time to is going to tell you what you value. Now that's the truth. Where do you spend your time? What are the thieves of time in your life? That'll tell you a lot about your values, a lot about what you uh value really value in your life what, what you treasure. How about let's treasure our time of prayer? 
can I encourage you to become a, a person of prayer that doesn't cease? That the mindset of God, you don't set that aside. Uh, <laughs> I tell you, we as humans, we need to find some consistency and we'll only find it as prayerful people consistently committed to disciplining our lives in the presence of God. That applies to me. Every bit as much as it applies to anyone else. I have got to stay in the presence of God. All right. Let's go to Azusa Street. But before we there, I go there, let's go to Topeka, Kansas. It's the end of the 19th century. In a, uh, in a, a Bible mission there in Topeka, Kansas, people were hungering after God. There was an assignment given to uh, a class that uh, was, their hearts were after God and said, and asked the question, what is the, what is the Bible sign of people receiving the Holy Ghost? And they spent a great deal of time studying that. They came back together and, and concluded that the sign was speaking in other tongues. You read the book of Acts and see if that's not consistent. Now, they were in a prayer meeting, a watch night service. That's the end of the 19th century. And as the new century was ushered in, in this prayer meeting, the Holy Ghost fell. Oh. It was amazing, an amazing thing. People, they... This one, they didn't have a heritage in this. They didn't have anybody showing them this the way. They were just asking God for all they could have. And the Holy Ghost fell in that humble little place with, with hearts that were humbling themselves and asking God to lead. From there, it spread all over the country and went down to Houston. Charles Parham was a man who I uh, was teaching in. A, I had a Bible school down there. And that's where we come across William Seymour. He was a black man. Parham was a white man. He couldn't have him in his regular classes because we were so filled with hate, with prejudice back then. Uh, it's an awful thing. It's a terrible thing. It, it, God does not approve of that. William Seymour uh, had uh, converted in a... Um, I believe it was a Methodist church in, in Indiana, but he had affiliated himself as a minister with a holiness group. He ended up in Houston, brought together with Charles Parham, received teaching on what had happened in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, he would sit outside uh, the, the classroom listening to the lectures going on inside. He was a man who was uh, committed to God, this all came through prayer. Somebody heard him preach from out in Los Angeles, said, hey, we got a holiness church out here. We need a pastor. Why don't you come preach for us? He did. Uh, they, they, um, uh, they voted him in as the pastor. And he just didn't have any better sense than just preach the truth. <laughs> he started preaching about the Holy Ghost that he had not yet experienced. And they locked the doors on him. They kicked him out. They weren't going to listen to that. Like, like a lot of people say. Well, they went to a prayer meeting. They went to some, when they couldn't get into the church, they went to people's houses. There's a great uh, documentary of this on, um, on the Sousa Street Revival. Uh, it's, it's on YouTube, just Azusa Street Revival documentary. You can find it. It's about an hour long, maybe a little more than an hour. Uh, and it is it, it's really it's really good. I don't agree with everything they say, uh, but I do agree with what happened. And I encourage you to, read, to, to take a look at that. 
What did happen without doubt is in those prayer meetings, people began to be filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues and miracles began to happen. One lady uh, came to the prayer meeting. She was filled with the Holy Ghost. She sat down at a piano and began to play and sing in like six different languages. The lady had never played the piano before in her life. It was a gift given to her by God and she didn't know all those languages. That was speaking in other tongues that people could come in and if they understood that language and they heard what she was saying, glorifying God. It started in a prayer meeting and it continued in a prayerful revival they eventually got too many people. They couldn't stay in that house uh, where they got started. They had, they went and rented an old uh, building on Azusa Street. The upstairs were like a, had been like a warehouse. The bottom uh, uh, floor had been a stable. Horses and all that comes along with that. And they uh, a building that was about 2,400 square feet per level. They had upwards of 800 people a night. It went on day after day, every day. And much of the time, it was 24 hours a day in the sweltering heat of 1906 Los Angeles. Of course, they weren't used to air conditioning back then. But they'd come in and they'd, uh, into this humble building without... Uh, there was nothing glorious about it except for the power of God. The whole second floor, or the majority of the second floor, was a room that was a prayer room. It was for tarrying in prayer. The bottom floor was all uh, a great big, I say great big, 24 square feet ain't that big. It's just a little bit bigger than the house that I'm sitting in right now uh, where I live. 2,400 square feet is not a lot, and you get 800 people packed in there. That's about three square feet per person. And, of course, the fire department didn't uh, limit the number of people per, uh, per house back then. They were coming in from all different churches, all different parts of the world. Missionaries hearing about this, coming from as far as India and from uh, China, and coming and wanting this outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and from there it just spread like wildfire all over the world, and it's still alive today. Praise God. How did it start? It started in a prayer meeting, the role of prayer. If we're going to have a mighty move of God in this day and age, it's going to only be because God's people humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. I want you to know we must seek the face of God. If we don't humble ourselves and pray and seek the Lord, he's under no obligation to heal our land <laughs> or to forgive our sins. Second Chronicles 7.14 is a marvelous verse, but you look, the first word is if. There's a condition you want the move of God in your life, then you need to be a praying person as much as you can. If, if you can only string three or four words together, then do what you can do, but talk to God. And that Azusa Street Revival spread all over the world. It exists today. It's still going on, and it's going to go on until Jesus comes. Well, thank you for joining me today. If we're going to see the revival that I believe God has ordained for, uh, for Crosby, for Texas, for the United States, for the world, then we must humble ourselves and pray. If we're going to see our lost loved ones, one to God, it's going to be because we humble ourselves and pray. Lord, I come right now and I come realizing that I am a, I'm just, just a child. I don't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. But you're wise. I'm weak and you're powerful. 
and I reach for your strength. I pray for revival in Crosby, Texas. I pray for revival across our world. I pray for revival in Nigeria. Bless the Phelps family. Oh God, that whole movement. Help them, Lord. I pray for revival, Lord, all over the world. I pray for revival in my heart. Would you forgive me of my weaknesses, please? Would you forgive me of my shortcomings and my failures? Would you forgive me, Lord, for the many times I have failed you? I regret it deeply. I'm, I'm so sorry. Would you forgive me? I know you will. I bless your name, Jesus. I know that you forgive me. And would you let me be a force for good in these last days? Maybe somebody, Lord, is praying along with me right now and hasn't yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I ask you, Lord, to reach out where they are right now. My God, miraculously, thrill them and fill them with the Holy Ghost. Praise God. If you're praying right now and you feel the unction of the Holy Ghost to speak out in some way that you don't quite understand, let it go. Enjoy it. Let the Holy Ghost come in and fill you with all the joy of the Lord that you can possibly comprehend. Oh, Jesus, thank you. I pray for your mighty move in our people, in our church, in our families, in our town. Lord, we're going to give you all the glory. All praise belongs to you. Bless the name of Jesus. Now keep us, Lord. Keep us until we come back together. I pray, Lord, for those who are struggling with this pandemic, for those of our loved ones who are struggling with this COVID-19. I ask that you send the Holy Ghost in the miracle-working power of healing. And I plead the blood of Jesus that blood by which we've been healed. I pray, Lord, you'll lift those up who are struggling. Let our faith reach out to you as our Savior and as our healer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the holy name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. My time got away from me and I went a little long today. I hope it was a blessing to someone. If you want to see the move of God, it's available for you. Just pray. God bless you.